Um, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Introduction to Growing Trees in CTNs. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Growing Diversity Project, I'm Hilary, and I'm the project coordinator. This project is a partnership between the Woodland Trust and Fellowship of the Trees, and is supported by the Forestry Commission's Tree Production Innovation Fund. So this webinar is one of a two-part series, and both webinars aim to provide a thorough overview of the key factors involved in planning and growing trees from seeds, and will include references to a few of the harder to source and grow species. The second webinar is on July the 9th, and I will share a link in the chat to this event as well as other events that we have planned. So do feel free to introduce yourself and the CTN that you're from in the chat um, and also ask any questions in there as well. There will be a Q&A after the presentation. So please ask in the chat if you wish to be unmuted and ask a question, or you can use the raise hand option in the reactions menu. So I think that's it for now. I'm just going to start by introducing our speaker, Adam Owen. Some of you already know Adam, I'm sure. He's been on a few of our webinars in the past and helped us quite a lot in setting up of the CTNC. So Adam's worked within the public, private and charity sectors over the past 30 years. Between 2018 and 2023, he was the director of More Trees in Devon. He invested and redesigned the infrastructure of the two tree nurseries there to enable increased productivity. In 2022, he co-authored The Tree Growers Guide and helped produce a range of how-to videos sharing his knowledge of growing and planting trees for the benefit of local communities across the UK. And now Adam divides his time working freelance, uh, which includes providing support to community tree nurseries in the UK and sailing. So it's lovely to have you back, Adam. Thanks for being here. Not at all. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me along to chat today. And um, if you're ready, then we just go move straight to the presentation. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Grand. So I'm just going to do a screen share and bring the presentation up. So earlier, if you could let me know if you're seeing that. Okay, it's just gone back. Oh, there yeah, we go. <laughs> Come back up. Yes. Fantastic. And let me just shrink. Okay, so I think we're pretty much ready to go. Real, shall we start? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. And um, you had the introduction. So, as you know, my name's Adam. And this is part one of Growing Diversity and the introduction to growing trees in community tree nurseries. So, I'm just going to, through this presentation, look at how to say what to grow and why, and the purpose for that, how many trees, where, where do we really start when we're thinking about growing trees, and then talk about the conditions we need and some of the things we need within our tree nursery to think about, both within the ground, but also materials and so forth, ground weed control. And then focus quite heavily today on the seed collection elements, seed preparation, stratification, germination, particularly focusing on hard to grow species. And then we'll do some Q&A. So we've got an hour and a half for this. Um, and I've got quite a few slides, but uh, this, these slides will be made available afterwards as well for people. So I've put quite a bit of information on, on the slides. I hope that uh, that will help you, um, when you when you look at them later and review them. So when we decide what to grow and why. So it could be that um, you're just a single person who's very interested in growing trees, or it could be you're part of a community group that's already working uh, nature-based conservation work. You could be rural, you could be in an urban environment. It may be that the trees you want to grow, you're thinking about woodland creation or hedgerows, or it could be that you want to grow in orchard trees or street trees or parkland trees. And all of 
that actually will inform how you want to choose to go about collecting your seed and also about how you're going to then grow these trees and um, in, in your nursery and the, and the kind of mechanisms you're going to use to get those trees to grow. So when it comes to growing trees, the first thing is it does take quite a lot of time and effort. So who is going to be doing the growing? And if it's a single person, then I would say start with a tiny number of trees and just do multiple species and have a go. And then you start to learn how much time is invested. In. Because again, if you're um, either retired or, or you're not working and you can give a huge amount of time to it, fantastic. But many people find you know that, that, that they only have perhaps five hours a week um, and, and there may be multiple people to do that. So it's very much there to think about the tasks and and have a great plan and go go forward and allocate if you've got multiple people sometimes specific tasks to individuals or responsibilities and things like that where are your trees going to be grown um do you have land do you have access to land is that land private is it within public ownership is it an allotment um how big is it do you have to pay rent or have you got it for free so again these will all be influential and these things I think are better to sort out now um, before you really go full full scale into growing trees and uh, and so you're very clear on your your objectives because if you're using part of your own personal garden you may not have a huge amount of space so you could be if you're wanting to grow large trees you may only be growing 10 12 trees over four or five years but if you're wanting to grow lots hundreds and hundreds of trees then again you know that if you to grow them in the ground then you're going to need a lot more space than if you were to grow them in pots for example we've talked a little bit about the kind of trees to be grown some community tree nurseries i know are very focused on uh, broadleaf species native broadleaf species but equally i know other community tree nurseries that are doing quite exotics um and particularly for parkland planting in london and then other tree nurseries are also going to do quite I think a few very skillfully do grafting and they're working with things like apple varieties and pear varieties. So it could be anything going forward that you that you want to do. And um when you when you're doing that again, it's the what type of tree. So are you going for seed with the seed? Are you going for specific types, as I say, that things like have nuts or winged seeds and so forth? We'll talk about these in a bit or or, or wind-driven seed, because the way you collect that and the way you process that changes as well. Um, and where are you getting the seed from? Do you have an easily accessible source? Um, what materials will you need when you go and collect them? What materials will you need to then grow the trees? And we'll, we'll delve into some of this as well. And a lot of people um, quite like the idea of growing trees, and then they grow trees, and then they um, scratch their heads because they can't get rid of their trees and that that is one of the challenges when we are actually growing trees is to make sure you do have a source um for them to go to so i know again some community nurses work very closely with the parish councils others work with another organization in in their area that may be um looking after one of the woodlands for example one of the community woodlands or they've got good links with people like the national trust the wildlife trust the local authority and they may be able to donate trees and uh, and some tree community units are indeed are selling their trees that they're growing so uh, they've had good success with that but when you get to this uh point then of getting the trees out you need to then be thinking about lifting them how you're going to package them safely and how you're going to transport them are people going to come collect them are you going to deliver them hand deliver them or are you going to mail them mail shot them and then you know if you do have trees, how are you going to let people know what trees you've got, how many, what number, and so forth. So there's lots and lots to, to consider. And initially, this seems like a, quite mind-blowing. But if you work through from the first process of finding some land and finding some people to help you and then getting the seed and then growing the trees, it's really before you even have a tree that is ready to go out into the ground two, two and a half, sometimes three years anyway. So you know, from first seed collection, there is quite a bit of time to plan up all of these things. Um, pest and disease is important, biosecurity. Uh, the the um, CTNC has had some, some webinars on biosecurity. I will be touching on it a little bit, but not, not so much in, in this session today. 
um, and record keeping as well, um, which is which is very important. But again, not going to really focus on that and pest and disease today. But in the second seminar, um, we'll look at some of those things. Um, just to give you an idea, when we're talking about trees, if you were to grow sort of 5,000 trees, that could be a full-time job for somebody um, once they're all going. Because if you imagine you've got five, you want 5,000 trees growing, you've probably got to actually have more seed, much more seed than that. And um, if you go on an average germination rate of 50%, then you're going to need 10,000 seeds of various species. Um, that's potentially out of that, you might get seven and a half thousand or you may get um, 6,000 of those germinating. So then you've got to get all those planted out and then you'll lose some as well, of course. And if you actually wanted to go higher than that, you really will, as I say, there small army of volunteers or staff to help. Uh, but equally, uh, you may just want to grow a few hundred. And there are some great community tree nurseries who are growing sort of three, four hundred trees, um, they're working um, with uh, forest schools and working with young people um, and school and and uh, they're getting those trees planted out into small community forests, which is fantastic. And uh, we've talked a, a little bit about this in terms of where they're growing and rents and so forth. But to give you an idea of area, if you had an area 4.8 meters by 1.2, and I use those measurements because 4.8 meters is the average length of a scaffold plank. And that was um, what was being used at the community tree nursery when we grew to, to edge, edge the, the beds. But within that, we grow about 250 to 300 trees into the bare earth. But in that same area, if we were to use root trainers, which you can see in the bottom uh, left of that picture, you could actually hold 1,600 trees in there, 1,600 trees. So again, depending when you're growing, you can get a lot into a small space. If you're going to grow them in, in specific small small containers, then if you do bare root. Um, but then if they're in containers, they're going to need a lot more uh, TLC as well. So when you're choosing how to grow, are you going to, uh, when you look at that land, are you going to grow them straight into the earth? So are you going to prepare beds and get them growing there? Or are you going to grow them in small pots or are you going to grow standard trees so then you'd be putting them into five litre pots then perhaps 10 litre pots then 20 litre pots and so forth until they get to such size and form to prune them and look after them uh are you putting them into raised beds because you your soil type might not be that great for for growing trees um fast so you may want to do some soil amelioration or have a raised beds or maybe you want raised beds simply for accessibility issues so again you've got to Think about how how you want to physically grow those trees. What what that space is going to look like. And if you have your um, soil, first thing I would do definitely, if once you've found where you're going to grow them, is go and find out what kind of soil you've got. And the best thing to do that is take a spade and just dig a few holes around the site and have a look at it. And uh, if you've got clay soils, as it says there. They're good in many ways because they hold water and can have high water content. So um, in winter, they can be quite good for, for, for tree growing. But unfortunately, summer, they can really bake off. And also, they can become quite compact if you've got a lot of traffic within within your site. So then that, that can cause root compaction and slow growth down. Sandy soils, uh, as you would imagine, you know, very drought prone. Um, very low nutrients within that, and and certain species will love that and they'll be fine, you know. And but other species will hate it, and they just will not will not uh, grow well. Um, silts pretty good, loam ideal. That's every everybody wants a loam loam soil. Um, but the best way to work with those is actually simply just organic matter. So if you can add organic matter to any of those, it's going to improve the condition of the soil. And so the first thing before you even start growing your trees and before you um, are planting anything out is to make sure that your soil is in the best condition to receive trees. And it, doing a simple soil test as well, multiple places within your site, and then you can work out, again, the nutrient values within that. And then you can think about if you need to add anything to improve the, the nutrient value of the soil. Because some of the sites, some people may... Um, 
have available you know the the soil could be in very poor condition could be highly compacted maybe it's been left over after some development work for example um it potentially has quite a few leachates into the soil but one of the good things about the trees is that they they can cope pretty well with them um, toxins within the soil better than some of the plants uh, peat, well, I doubt anybody will be planting into peat soils, but I just put it in there. Uh, very seldom found in gardens, usually on upland sites, and, and obviously peat is um, very, very important in terms of its own ecology. So I'd never suggest that planting will grow into, into a peat environment, uh, peat, yeah, peat environment. And chalky soils, they can be quite challenging to work with because they, the soils are very thin. Um, so, and it may be with if you were really on very very thin soils on 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 a chalk landscape, you may be better doing some raised beds or something like that. And then uh, it comes to people asking about composting. So composting is is uh, good to to a point. I we found that it's great to get rid of sort of uh, green green waste and and the greens and browns. So your browns being like dried. Um, plant material or, or uh, paper card and things like that greens are, as it sounds uh, but you really need to mix them both in so there's no point putting loads of grass cuttings into a compost and then expecting it to make great compost it just will not and so you need to mix these greens and browns and leave it for quite some time if it's too dry it won't compost if it's too wet it won't compost um and really if you can hot composting is best and there's you know there's plenty of uh, science and reading around that and um, again CTNC held a good composting webinar a while ago and you can uh, I'm sure that you can be found online but your hot composting is important because you want to get rid of any weed seeds within that which it will because it will denature the seeds so if you were uh, cold composting you could find if you then put that straight into your bed that uh, um you're going to just end up with lots and lots and lots of weeds, which um, can definitely be a problem when you, you know, when you're planting, you're trying to get trees established initially. Um, I I would say if you're ever going to use homegrown compost, then I would um, use that sort of quite deep and then layer above that with with better grey compost, you know, but to a depth really where those weed seeds aren't going to um, come through. So. With ground preparation and uh, double digging, um, some people advocate this, and people would seem to be moving away from this when I'm talking to 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 people. But really, that you will be really heavily working the ground. It takes a lot of time, a lot of um, energy, um, and you know, there's quite a lot of carbon release. Um, you can actually bring up to the surface some. Um, plant seed which you know you may not know is there and then you're going to end up with more weeds uh, so double digging I think is it, it, I, I probably wouldn't double dig unless I had a really highly compacted site and then I really would probably just loosen that with a, with a fork more than more than actually dig it over and then add lots of organic matter on the, on, on the surface and this is where no dig can work very well and there's um, different types of no dig methods and there's an image there which just demonstrates a few of them where you can layer but it's about putting layers on top of the actual soil so they act as a mulch it acts as a weed suppressant um and it and it acts to improve the soils below it and then you plant into that and the roots go through and into the soil below so no dig can work very very well um, but it can also be quite expensive if you're buying in lots and lots of organic matter to to add onto the top because you will be adding organic matter every single year to to build up the the nutrients in the soil and make sure the soil profile is good for growing in. Um, and raised beds as well um, mentions that particularly on very very thin poor soils or if you got accessibility is important then you know you may want to put in some raised beds so you would have to create a structure holding that growing medium um and and again you know there's a there's costs involved in that uh with pots so here we've got uh, different types of pots your standard ones on the top left that's what we're all familiar with uh just plant pots and there's uh many small community nurseries which 
you know they they recycle pots and and people in the village donate plant pots and and they grow the they stratify the seeds in there they grow the trees in those plant pots it works really well the other pots are I'd say for more um I don't want to use the word professional, but I'm going to by that I mean I, I mean you know these are horticultural um, horticultural pots specifically for growing. So the the one in the middle, the Hanix one, which is this one here, they're they're root trainers, and you can get different sizes of these. Um, and the, the deeps and the maxes, as, and the maxi ones are the ones that are recommended for broadleaf trees. We use slightly smaller ones for um, coniferous trees. But in essence, these open up for each set of four opens up like a buck, close it, you put your compost material into each one of these, and then your seed grows in, or your if uh, if you're doing acorns, you just put these, put that straight in there. Um, if you're using um you've grown stuff in seed trays, then once those plants are big enough, you might pick them out and put one into each one of these. And then they sit in this crate, if you will. And so you can get 40 in a very small space. And in in an area about forty five centimeters long and thirty centimeters wide, you will get forty trees. So so they're great space savers. <laughs> but again, um, these plastic pots, even if you really look after them, you're probably only going to get two to three seasons out of them. So if you're very conscious about plastic waste, these might not be for you. These ones here by Containerize, these are much more robust. So. You get less in the space. They're, they're a similar size of in area to this one here, the root trainers. And there's 28 in this, this one. Again, they do different sizes, but these two sizes are comparable. So you get less, but, and they don't open up either. Um, but what they both do, they have these holes at the bottom. And that means that it air prunes. So when the tree roots grow out at the bottom, then they dry out and 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 uh, and so the tree just stays neatly inside each of these individual containers of pots and puts on a huge amount of root mass which is why the industry uses them a lot because what you want is a really good strong healthy tree not just above ground but more importantly below ground with a really good root mass um so these pots are great but again with pots they dry out so irrigation and watering is super important and then over here on the left, these are what's known as air pots. And you make these up. So you buy a roll of the black outside bit, and then you get different diameter meshes. So you can make different size pots. And the great thing is they're reusable. They're really robust. And these are great if you want to grow bigger trees. So you perhaps start your tree in a small pot like this, and then you plant it into a five liter one of these. And then you might plant it into make a once it's got a good size, again put in a ten liter one, twenty liter one, and and really they 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 got, get they can get quite large. But with that comes weight, obviously. But if you want to grow standard trees, um, that are perhaps two meters tall, and you form to prune them, and these are these are great. And the good thing is, is then what you can do is you can take that external pot off, simply wrap the roots there in something like hessian. Um, and then you know you sell it or give it, uh, donate it like that, and, and you can plant it out. You can actually plant it out in the hessian as well. Uh, absolutely fine. So it keeps all the soil and compost contained. Uh, the, these are very good, but again, quite pricey. But if you're planning to do a lot of taller trees, then they're worth the investment. In terms of weed control, um, again, uh, with 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 weeds. It's um, the suppression of the weeds is 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 important initially when getting things started. Particularly, for example, if you did birch seed and then you were to just broadcast that onto the ground, just spread it onto the ground onto onto bare earth, and you have weeds in there as well that will come through. The weeds will grow faster than the birch seed will initially, and it could compete it with it, and then you know you're going to lose a lot of your seed. So uh, no dig works well because there's a lot of weed suppression within that because you're putting that organic matter on the top. Mulching, um, wood chip. Some people do put wood chip down as a mulch. I'd say it needs to be quite quite fine because if you use um, quite chunky bits of wood chip, then it works well as a mulch, but ultimately that gets into the soil um, and it takes a long time to actually biodegrade. Um, so you end up with a, lots of 
basically bits of small timber in your, in your, in your bed, which is the ideal. Again, think about timing um, with weeding and and um, when you're choosing to plant out because, uh, you know, if you spend the winter and you pull all your weeds out of the bed and so forth, and then you, and then you plant your seeds and don't do anything, then you are going to get a huge amount of weeds over the summer. And also about <laughs> if you're not using beds and you weed them, but then leave them, they will very soon cover themselves again with weeds. So you may wish to think about putting things to fallow. So using some material over the top just to keep that weed suppression in place before you take before you um before you take that cover off and, and plant into it in the spring with the trees that you've got growing. But once your trees are actually up and you know if they're growing they're 20 centimeters tall and you want them to grow up to say 60 centimeters, then actually you know the weeds aren't so so much they get shaded out. So there's not that significant weed growth. It's as if you've got big issues with things like couch grass and so forth like that, that you probably want to keep an eye on it. Um, but for the most part, you shouldn't really need to be using any um, chemicals. I know that more trees, I don't think they use, well, certainly in my time and before that, um, the, the trustees and staff saying they've never ever used things like glyphosate or um, other, other weed control other than mulching and covering the ground and so forth. So, but the weeds can be a problem if you, when you come to lift, you've got a lot of lots of weed there in, in the soil. Um, so they need to you need to keep on top of them. Um, so the next we'll have a look at seeds. So uh, we have some uh, some images of of seed here. One's on the left in my hands. Thank you. Um, modeled by me. Who knew I was a hand model too? So we've got that, yew seed, you'll see that, elm seed, uh, small leaf lime seed. So these may be some of the typical seeds that you would be would be collecting to grow some trees. And um, I would recommend when, when you're starting out, start with low numbers, start simple. Um, you know, you've got, uh, try growing, as I say, there's sort of five different trees or seed types and growing sort of between 20 and 100 of each each one, each species or each and each seed type. Because you've got the nuts that, and you've got winged seeds and you, you know the things like the birch, you've got the windblown seeds as well. So they each have different treatments. Um and uh and and it's good to get used to working with different types of seeds, fleshy seeds and um stones, you know, pips like like blackthorn or cherry and so forth. So you get to learn how to um, process that seed, how to stratify, get it to germinate, and then and, and get it to grow. In terms of seed collection, definitely um, collect your seeds uh, if you're doing a native broadleaf or um, in partland trees that have grown local to you. Then you, you know go and ask permission if um, if, if it's not on public land, and uh, uh, to, when you go and collect that seed, the cuttings is also very simple. So cuttings, uh, particularly from things like willow, are very easy to do as well. And we'll talk about talk about that in, in, a, in a short while. But when you're going to your local area and you're thinking about where you may want to collect seed, this is just currently um, where I am at the moment, down Haven, near, near Portsmouth. Very simple, just take an OS map. And you can immediately see here, you've got plenty of woodland that runs up through here. This is Country Park owned by Hampshire County Council up here. These are Forest Commission owned land as well. Plenty of footpaths running through them. Um, within this open area, I know this area, there's a lot of parkland trees within here as well. So great area to go and collect seed in. And when you're going to do your seed collection, it's worth taking a walk um, at the start of the season. So going for walks around now and just seeing what trees are there and then having to think about what you might want to collect from. And then uh, as those trees come into seed, it's worth going out again and see, are they putting up, are they, are, is it a good year for tree seed for that species? Um, where where are the trees that are accessible that I can physically go and collect the seed from? And uh, do I need to get permission for that and so forth? And sort all that out and watch how the seed ripens because you know, every summer seeds ripen a similar amount of time, but generally they there is differences. To, you know, and particularly around the country, there's differences. Weeks 
perspective difference between when those seeds are actually really ripe. Um, and when you're going to finally go and collect that seed, then you would need to uh, have with you, you know, like a, either a hoot stick, a walking stick, something like that, to get those low branches, bring them down to you, something to put the seed in. Though uh, that, I would say, multiple containers, uh, little painter's buckets, actually, from Screwfix. Uh, I haven't got a sponsorship deal with them, but they are brilliant, and they're about this size, and you can get a huge amount of seed into just one of those. And I would never, ever mix seeds from different species because sorting out in, in one container, the sorting out afterwards is an absolute pain in the neck. And um, also think about how much you collect. And uh, because you you can easily go off and collect far more than you can possibly process. So think what again what your end game is for that year's uh, how many how many you actually want to to grow, um, and that's sort of it with the seed collection itself. Do try and collect on dry days if it's been heavily raining for a few days and you're thinking of going get birch. Wait until it's been dry and windy for a few days because it's far easier to collect that seed birch seed when it's very very dry than it is when it's wet and also. If you collect seed when it's wet, then you really need to sort of get onto managing it quite quickly because very soon it will start to um, uh, degrade. You know, so so you so if you were thinking you you're not going to you're going to go out one weekend and collect some seed and then it's going to sit in a bucket somewhere for a couple of weeks before you get round to it, it's probably not ideal. Again, you need to plan your time for for the seed and um, and what you're going to do with it. And unfortunately, most broadleaf tree seed also comes along within a six-week period. So it is quite a busy time too when you have to go and pick all that stuff up. There is, I'm just going to touch very quickly on biosecurity and the forest reproductive materials. So the um, forest reproductive materials is a piece of legislation in this country where really we should, um, if you were growing trees, and particularly if you're growing trees and you're going to sell them, um, inform the Forest Commission for certain species, what's known as the mandatory species, and inform them that you are going to go and collect that seed. And then once you've collected that seed, inform them how much of that seed that you have collected. And it's it's a control measure which was brought about and when the Forest Commission was um, engaging contractors, really, to, to, to collect seed for them. Um, on their behalf, you know, to grow forest trees, so nurseries growing forest trees. And it's all about biosecurity. You need to know where you've collected that seed from, what type of seed it is, how much of it you've got. And then and then it's got, um, I use the call track and trace, basically, after COVID, it's the easiest explanation, it's track and trace for tree seed. And, uh, and you need to go and follow this process. Now, a lot of community tree nurseries don't engage with this process. Um, and the Forestry Commission haven't come down on, on community tree nurseries who aren't doing it. But there is a growing um, concern within within uh, the forest and tree nursery sector that if lots and lots of small nursery growers are starting to grow trees, then there is potentially biosecurity risks, which and and certain things need to have to be monitored and managed. The you know FRM is one of them. Now, if you were to start to increase your production cycle, you have to increase numbers. Then you definitely need to be thinking about this and. We've done seminars on this before, um, and there's plenty of information online, and uh, you're more than welcome to ask me as well. I can I can run through stuff with you even on a one-to-one -one at, at, at some point, perhaps. Um, when you're going um, and collecting your seed, talking there about different types of um, containers. So you know your seed buckets I've mentioned about, but some people put them in Ziploc bags, some people paper bags for things like birch and so forth. Um, if you don't want to do cold stratification, you'll need somewhere to refrigerate it. You definitely need to be able to store it somewhere where mice and squirrels aren't going to get to it because they will just snaffle all the things that you've just connected. Um, and you need to label everything because you will, uh, if you collect so much seeds, you know, it's quite easy to get species or where it was collected from, how much of it and so forth. Um, so you need to keep a record of that. And it is good practice to record seed weight, um, what's called wet weight and dry weight. And whilst it's a requirement for the forest um, reproductive material regulations, as I said, it's actually quite good for yourself as well to start some of this record keeping because you'll then 
understand um, after a period of time, a number of years, if you if you if you're in this for the long haul, uh, you know that right this much of this seed type uh, generally produces this many trees. So you could go out and you could collect say you could go and collect 150 acorns, and your experience, but through that like you know a few years, may show that every time you collect 150 acorns, you end up getting about 60 oaks. At, yeah, that are three years old, something like that, or oh, higher, just an example. Um, and and, and doing your weight can uh, be a way of simply managing this in a, in a very simple spreadsheet. And and there it's just talking about how you can do the dry weight because when you're doing things, particularly things like rowing, which are tiny seeds, and you could probably get you know five to ten seeds on your little fingernail. Um, there are there are ways that you can just weigh and then average out. So you get the average weight of a seed or you can you know, look at a batch of um, rowan seeds and then by weighing that and you've done done the done done this this process here, um, which you can read in your, in your own leisure, you'll be able to work out approximately how many seeds you've got, because you definitely don't want to be counting them one by one by one. And the processing of seed is um very manual and and people have preferred methods and some of those are um you know uh well it could be with cherry it might be you just want to eat all the cherries and spit the stones out but uh you know some people mash them with potato mashes some people rub them in sieves the fleshy ones this is um and then other other people create a, a board with uh with, with mesh on it on one side and then and then a, a a block with the mesh on it and then they can grate off grate off the flesh that way and uh, it's um it is, it is quite an intense process but it's good it's good it's good and sociable particularly if there's a group of you and it's nice weather and you can sit out there and just you know drink tea and eat cake and and process seed to your heart's content certain seeds definitely don't need processing things like the acorns you can see on top of the picture there nice and simple they will collect those um and they can chit themselves and you know that's put their little little root out and and then you can pot that and off they go they're absolutely fine apple crab apple is quite easy because you're just cutting it open and getting the pips out um probably the most finickety one is rowan and uh, that, that's at the bottom the bottom two pictures you can see there so you've got the rowan berries they're really mushy really really sticky um and you've got to do a lot of rinsing of get the flesh off and rinse, get the flesh off, and then eventually you'll get to the seed. Because uh, part of the problem with leaving the, the the flesh on the seed, if you um, you can um, the seed will start to rot basically, and uh, and so if you if if you want to do um, get quite a high germination rate, you want to process your seed more intensely than if you're not worried about germination rate. Then yes, you could just put all of that rowan without even taking the flesh off um mix it into some compost and we'll talk about this in a moment and and then put that in the bucket and just cover it over and see what comes up that's the easiest way but if you want to get high germination rates processing seed is is important and then in terms of preparing seed for stratification a technique that we um, employed at more trees was we would get these coir blocks so if you follow the pictures around uh clockwise so here, these blocks of coir, we got them from London Grow. Um, they come as a dried block. So we then soak it and then squeeze all the water out of it. So it's just damp. We've got our processed tree seeds. We then mix the coir and only the coir with some of the tree seed into a Ziploc bag. We write on what it is. So we've got how many seeds, the weight of the seeds, um, the seed type and where it's come from in the year that it was collected. Leave it open. So it can breathe, the bag can breathe. And they were doing cold stratification in this example. And so they've gone into the fridge. And then having them in the Ziploc bags means you can take them out periodically. You can inspect them without even opening the bag. You can see if they're too wet, too dry, and, and do whatever you need to adjust that scenario. And then eventually you'll see that they just simply, just like all seeds, they just sprout uh into into the coir and at that point you can then take that entire bag and spread that uh, onto a seed tray water it in 
and uh, and off they go like crests. So that's a good way of doing stratification. Uh, there are other ways, and you'll read about them. But I'm just uh, this is the way that you know we sort of did it more trees, <laughs> and they still do, and they have very successful germination rates. So each tree seed type um, has these different methods of e extraction. So as I said, put them into these sort of four or five main types. Um, you can direct sow your nuts, so things like hazelnuts, oaks, and so forth. Um, and it's best if you can collect them when they're starting to sprout, but then you're always competing against the squirrels, to be honest with you. So what you can do is also collect them. And then if you were to um, put them, uh, get some card out and some newspaper and then put them on that and then water the newspaper and card and then put cover that, the seeds that are on that with more newspaper and card and water that, then it creates a very humid environment. Um, and you just check them every so often, don't let them dry out and they will start to open and will start to put out this um this radical when they'll start to chit and then you know you can see it's quite simple at that point if that if if they're putting that out that wants to be that seed wants to be a tree because some tr seeds are duds and then you know you, if you went and planted every single acorn you found you might not find that they're all growing because some seeds simply you know the, the, the little embryo in there isn't, isn't active won't activate um but other stuff, uh, sometimes you put you, as I said, the cold storage can actually germinate, um, get to a germination point quicker. So you could do your direct sowing, as I said, with the oak or um, the hazel, and you could direct sow, but it may take two plus years to actually eventually germinate. Um, and you've already removed the husk. But if you do this cold uh, stratification, then actually you can get it to germinate faster. Um, again, taking the flesh off, I've mentioned about that, and mix them in um, with a sort of compost, compost or sharp sand, a 50-50 mix, or something into the choir. Um, just have a bit of an experiment as well and see see what works for you. Make lots of notes. Um, that, you know, you might want to try one bag, simply just compost. You might want to try one bag with compost sharp sand, 50-50. Just, just have a go. Because, um, again, around the country, this people have different methods and... Um, what seems to work in some places doesn't work in others. So, so a bit of an experimentation. And um, the pips we've talked to, talked about already talked about uh, Rome, but things like hawthorn again, crab apple the same. The and the birch and the older with that, then you just keep those dry in the bag over the over the winter. So they're nice and dry in the paper bag over the winter, and then you would do a soap treatment with those, um, and uh, and then from there. You would then plant those out. So there are tree species known as um, difficult to grow and easy to grow. And you know, the Woodland Trust and um, other organizations within the UK are really interested in these difficult to grow species. So for the purpose of today, I have focused on these species here, looking at particular techniques for them. Um, again, I know there are many people within in, in the webinar today who are already growing and you may have their own successful methods and I'd be interested to hear about them. But uh, one of the things where I started was with the Forest Commission. So they have this guide, which is available online, Raising Trees and Shrubs. And uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, at the back of it, they have this table with storage and pre-treatment summary. And they've gone through lots of different species and very scientifically worked out uh, how to how to get them to germinate. So this is just a zoomed in here. So you can see there's quite a few here. So Sorbosaria, Barrow uh, White Beams, and then Ewes, Limes, uh, Witch Elm, Wayfaring, Gelder Rose, so native broadleaf trees. And then they're talking about these seed characteristics. So as it says there, orthodox is easy to store, but dormancy, deep and hard, basically those aren't great words because what that means is they can be quite difficult to get to germinate. Um, and they have worked with moisture content as well. Now, it's quite challenging, I would say. I don't think we've ever worked with moisture content. Uh, time more trees and other community tree nurseries, no, haven't measured moisture content. It tells you in this document how you can measure it, but 
So um, we've really just sort of focused on the times that we've done any pre-treatments and done any warm or ambient temperature stuff or cold temperature. And they have, as you can see, quite a wide range of stuff. I mean, you here, they're talking, you know, keeping it up to potentially a year as a as a cold treatment. So with a with a, with a up to even a year as a warm treatment, and then telling you that actually it's not that efficient. It's uh, three, and it's very difficult to get them to grow. So, but I know because I've been talking to a lady Pippa, um, who's uh, she's she gets her you to 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 germinate really quickly. So you know. Um, you may you may do better than the Forestry Commission, but it, it, this is a good place to start. Bit bit of a guide here. Um, also, there's uh, the Tree Growers Guide within that. So, in uh, a few years ago, um, I was working more trees. Was working with the Tree Council, Norfolk County Council, Cornwall uh, County Council, and we updated the Good Seed Guide and. We uh, produce the tree growers guide, which is available. And within that, against each of the species, we have these little charts, which says the best time to collect, um, when to sow, and if there's periods of stratification required, and then when to sow, grow, plant, and so forth. And then this little caveat here really is saying, each of your trees wants to be a minimum of 20 centimeters high, with a root collar, which is the thickness of the stem just above soil level, of you know five or six mil it says it's specific to 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 various species before you even think about lifting it out of the ground or taking it out of the pot and planting it out into a hedgerow or into woodland and so forth um that's to make sure that the tree has, has at least got some reasonable root mass and uh and energy you know it's got decent leaf cover to photosynthesize to 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 get it to survive um the bigger the tree then it's quite often the better its chance of survival up to, you know, sort of 60 centimetres. Beyond that, they actually then can need quite a bit of TLC in terms of watering because they've got quite a high water uptake that's required um, before the roots really start to start to get out. So I'd say 40, 60s in terms of height is ideal for trees being planted out to woodland and hedgerows. But if you were to do standard trees, then that's very different because, you know, you've invested a lot of time you know, potentially five, six years in a tree. So those are trees that might go into gardens or into parks, which would then need a rigorous watering regime for the first two summers. So we get on to the species. Um, Gelder rose. So again, uh, I'm just going to go over these reasonably quickly, um, simply because you will have this presentation, you can read it at your own, own leisure. But the important thing with the seeds is collecting them when when they're when they're ready to be collected. You know when they when when they're at their optimum. So the Gelder rose is that late autumn when it's beautiful, vibrant red, um, and it is important to remove the flesh from these seeds so you get the get the clean seed. Now, option A is I talk about is what more trees has been doing. Option B I talk about is talking to um, Pippa John and 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 what she's been doing. It's quite interesting the the difference in the two. So where the seed was really processed, dried off, put in a coir mix, refrigerated for a period of time, um, and then sown the following summer. You know there was very good germination rates, high germination rates. So when Pippa was putting hers uh, seed into, so still the flesh was removed, the seed was going. So she'd take the pot put stones in the bottom, add this compost sand mix, carbon gold and horticultural sand as a 50-50 mix, and then put the seed in a ratio of a third seed, two thirds, put in the pot. Then the pot, <coughs> pardon me, went into a porch um, for around 15 degrees Celsius, so went out, and then went outside. And it was 18 months, so still got a reasonable germination rate, but that was 18 months later, whereas by doing the cold stratification, you will get germination sort of within six to eight months. So to speed it up, and that, that's sort of one of the advantages of, of doing the cold stratification. But the beauty of doing it Pippa's way is simply you just put that in in the pot and pretty much walk away, um, and then and then just check on it and make, make sure it doesn't dry out. But but ultimately, you just don't set what comes up. Holly <clears throat> again, um, another hard to. Uh, 
all these are sort of the hard hard ones, the more difficult ones to 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 get going. So with the holly, uh, one of the things again, collecting it when it's um, when it's red and uh, a bit squishy, um, and sometimes to help get the flesh off. Actually, if you want to keep them all together, just in a bucket by themselves and see themselves, and just just keep going, and just wait till that flesh starts to get a bit more softer and a bit more juicy and slough off. It will certainly help. In terms of removing the flesh and cleaning the seeds, so that's 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 one. You can also use I, I've never done it, but um, read about it. It's like a vinegar acid wash because they have these stone ones and the pips. They're very 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 hard, um, and you really when when you're doing stratification, what you're trying to do is to break that down. So there's potentially a small acid wash could soften the husk. If you leave it in too long. And it gets absorbed through the husk. It could then damage the seed. So you know, there's a there's a there's a risk to it. But with this one, um, um, it refrigerated right the way through the winter, and then it kept it at ambient temperature in a dark room until October, and then put it through another winter as well to the following March and sowed. And if they didn't germinate, <clears throat> just repeat the process with the ones that didn't germinate and. Finding the reasonable germination rate by doing that, this is, you know, doing the cold, warm, cold. Um, in Pippa's way, she found very low germination rate after 18 months. So a similar time frame, but by doing the cold, warm, cold, I actually got a higher germination rate for, for that seed. But Holly's super slow growing. It doesn't like being transplanted, certainly not until it's quite, quite um, reasonable size. And that's why when you actually go... And buy holly from a tree nursery as opposed to buying oak or a hawthorn. Um, when you're buying it you know, for woodland planting, it's a much more expensive plant. It takes a lot longer to grow, and uh, and a bit more TLC. But um, it does work. Small leaf lime. So this this one, first of all, sourcing a small leaf lime and knowing it's a small leaf lime, that's the biggest challenge, I think. But if you have managed to source one, then really. Um, do have an experiment interesting enough um, in Devon, South Devon, where more, more trees is. Um, we haven't had great success with small leaf lime. Been doing different experiments, different time frames, keeping some warm, doing some as refrigerated, um, leaving some, you know, just to just sort of to go through within within a stratification mix outside, like in a bucket, and really dependable uh, variable, sorry, results. Um, and yet in uh, where Pippa is in, in Sussex, they just remove the wing and then they put the seed uh, into the bucket and they found that they were getting really high, um, really high germination rates, you know, as well and six months. But if not sure whether that's something to do with climate. So in East Sussex is definitely drier than it is in South Devon. It's definitely warmer for more time of the year. Does that make the small leaf lime seeds in Sussex uh, more viable, basically, than the lime seeds that we're getting over in, in, in South Devon? So it'd be really interesting to know about your experiences around the country with that um, and to get some feedback if you've been growing uh, small leaf lime, what you've been doing and um, and where you are. It's a quite, quite a fascinating one, but it'd be a great tree to grow. And, and it, we may actually start to see small leaf lime germinating, you know, because it's always been known as to be quite difficult to 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 get to to germinate in this country uh, and get seeds that are viable. But maybe with you know the changing climate, the tree will will start to produce more viable seed. Who knows? <clears throat> uh, with I'm trying to get this there we go. Move it, moving on. Um computer just having a think. Spindle, uh, with, with spindle, we collect in with um, pinky red, you know, very vibrant color. You really see it when you when you uh, move, um, see it when you're walking through the woodlands. It's one of those things that really, really stands out. But the important thing with the processing is to remove uh, both the pink and the orange. So if you take that sort of outside cover off, you'll see inside the seeds, and those seeds are covered in orange and orange flesh. Do definitely get that orange flesh off because it does hinder um, germination. And here again, uh, more trees did it 
dark room, ambient temperature through to January, then refrigerated it from January through to April, then sowed it and got really high germination rates and really strong, vigorous growth. Um, Pippa did the 18 months, but still was getting low germination rate. Uh, but those that germinated did grow very well. So this, again, just demonstrating this treatment, you know, putting it through sort of cold shock, warm, cold shock, that does actually definitely increase um, germination rates and, and gets it through the stratification process faster. Um, Wayfaring tree. And this, again, I think really is about um, the getting the seeds at the right time. So uh, in we didn't find a wayfaring tree when I was when I when I was there at uh, Moor Trees, didn't find a seed source. But <laughs> in Sussex, they were collecting them when the seed was just turning over from red to a darker color, but not drying out. Remove the flesh. Um, again, putting it in the pots and leaving it. And they were getting um, six month germination rate. So, you know, it's quite a short period of time, but found low germination and low vigor. So it would be quite interesting to see if we could find the seed and run it through some cold stratification or some cold warm shock treatment like that, whether or not that germination rate would, would increase. On the white bean, um, again, you know, the, the, that collection period of time so again when they read it's on the turn but but not not drying out um and we found mixed germination rates with this at both both sides we're, we're talking with them um, dave uh at more trees and, and people down, down in sussex but the, those that germinated they grew really really well um so it will be will be again good to get more data on some of these these tree species no one has yet managed to find wild pear and grow it from seed in the people I've spoken to. So if anybody out there has, please get in touch with me and let me know. But the suggestion is same, use the same process as apple, which is just cut it open, take the seeds out. Again, we put that into a coin mix um, um, or direct sow and, 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 and let it go. But just to make people aware the Plymouth pear, the virus called out, is a protected species. So the wild pear isn't, but the the Plymouth pear is. So if you want to take cuttings or take a pear from one of those trees, then you would need a special license from National England. Wild service tree. Um, again, with that one, apparently um, you can eat the flesh of them and they are very nice. But similar to the wayfaring one, uh, pretty much low germination rate, low vigor. So again, would these benefit from some cold shock? Witch elm, one of the problems, uh, quite a lot of people who um, try and grow witch elm, they sometimes struggle because they're actually collecting it too late. So they're not getting it from either the tree or just when it's starting to fall. And then what they do is they hold on to it. And holding on to it is the thing that's worst thing. Really want to get it and put it straight onto pre-prepared compost field seed trays, make sure that compost is damp. And then keeping that compost constantly damp um, and the seeds would, should only take a few weeks to germinate. It's one of those seeds that doesn't need to go through um, a long period of germination, doesn't need this hot, cold cycle if you want them to do that kind of stratification. Um, they will they will generally germinate in a few weeks. As I say there, there's always a caveat, some can lie dormant for a year, but you can get a very high germination rate from witch elm. And um, people think about Dutch elm disease and that, but there's a, a lot of mature witch elms in this country which have come through it and showed good disease resistance. I think potentially by taking seeds from those trees and then growing them and then planting them out, you're simply just increasing the opportunities for those trees in future generations to have a higher disease resistance. And um, and, and who knows, it may be nice to see some mature elms coming back into the landscape in the next 50 years. You, uh, again, with this one, it is, as the Forest Commission said, and as Pippa has found out, really hard to, to, to get that to go. Um, and the Forest Commission was using cold treatment or warm treatment as well. Pippa's using the ambient temperature and then putting them out in um, sort of 15 degrees and then, and then putting them out after that. Um, 18 months is quite common, I think, for you. Uh, it does take a long time. 
uh, low germination rate, low vigor is what we've found. But again, if you've had better success, um, again, we're very, very interested to know and we can share that information and, and help people be growing some of these trees. Beech, uh, beech is one of those, well, a lot of trees actually do produce non-viable seed. Um, and they think it's actually a bit of a defense mechanism um, for, you know, when, when, when they're going to get predated, the seed's going to get predated. Um, potentially, it's uh, um, it just, I don't know, confuses the animals. I know it sounds crazy, but I read it in the Forestry Commission document. Um, and so it must be true. But uh, beach is one of those where quite often you'll see lots and lots and lots of beach sh shells, if you will, but inside there's absolutely no seed whatsoever. Um, so do make sure that the seed is present, first one. Remove that husk, um, mixing it with a stratification mix, refrigeration. <clears throat> and this is one of the ones that people do refrigerate and also uh, more trees, Dave as well does this. Uh, and then sow in the spring and you can get a very high germination rate and uh, reasonably vigorous growth coming from those. With your birch, alder and your pine, so again, you want to get these seeds just when they turn brown, they're papery, when the cones are starting to ripen and open with um, the catkins from, from the birch. It's simply just sort of run your fingernails down that catkin, let all the seeds fall into a container. Um, cones, you can put those into paper bags and wait for the seeds to drop out. Pine seeds may need a bit of help extracting them. Uh, but basically, yeah, let that open up and then extract the seeds from them. Rehydrate uh, before, so so keep them in your brown paper bag and you know somewhere where you know, mice aren't going to get to them. Uh, they're not going to get damp. But then, um, before you sow them, so talking around February time, um, rehydrate so those seeds by soaking them, strain them off, put them into a stratification mix, put them in the fridge for a month, and then sow them. <laughs> and you can broadcast those either onto the ground or you put them into seed trays and you should get high germination rates and very high vigor. Some of the easiest ones to grow, actually. And then we come, I'm coming on to cuttings now. So that, yes, there are many other species out there, but there, there is a good example of different seed types and, and, and techniques. So you can experiment with that with, with other species as well. In terms of cuttings, um, you can get cuttings for things like willow, aspen, poplar. And ideally take those cuttings uh, in, in the spring with the willow, take them, as it says there, about 15 centimetres long, but no, you know, no, definitely no thicker than a centimetre, sort of pencil thickness is ideal. And then <clears throat> cut them and place them in water. And you refresh the water every so often, but those... Um, those those cuttings will just start to sprout root hairs, and once those root hairs are of reasonable length, then just put them straight into plant pots, and off they go. Um, the interesting thing uh, with with them is they they will want a lot of moisture. So if you've got them in pots, you'll need to keep them regularly watered, or simply put the pot in a water bath and top the water bath up, and not off they go. As I said, that um, may benefit from shade netting, but cuttings in spring can usually get sufficient growth off that cutting so that you can transplant it straight out in, into the autumn. They're really easy to do uh, and really fast results as well. So if you're working, if you're working with young people um, and children, then you know willow could be a, a really great, great one to do because they will see the results immediately um, and, 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 and encourage them sort of to, to continue working with nature. It's good stuff. Aspen, you can take cuttings from the roots. So there's quite a bit of information in that. Um, and again, I'll leave that for you to, to, to read in your own time once you've, once you've got the presentation. But in essence, you, you're, you're taking runners, um, some of the root runners, and chopping sections out, and then uh, growing from, from those bits of root. And again, it can work very well. The other thing is that, um, I mean, it all depends how much space you've got, but Putting seed tray, damp seed trays, so it's the, the composting seed tray, it's all nice and damp. Uh, putting those below um, aspen trees, when the aspen seeds start to fall and they just fall straight onto those, as long as they're kept damp and moist, then those aspen seeds will again also start to very quickly germinate. Uh, and then you can pick them out and pot them on from there. 
it's another way to, to get aspirin too. So in terms of stratification, I've mentioned the word, if you're using these, a natural process, a natural process will be putting it into a pot of compost and walking away and just letting nature, just like it's fallen on the forest floor, it's been covered over with some leaf litter, will it germinate, will it not germinate? Or you can use an artificial process, which we talked about, you know, the warm and then the cold stratification. The interesting thing with, um, with these, if you're using stratification in pots, you just must protect, you must get them covered over. You still want moisture to get to them, so actually this meshing or netting works very, very well. Um, gauze that go, goes over the top wire gauze uh, to stop the squirrels and the mice and voles and so forth from burrowing in and taking them all. Uh, in the past, a direct sowed oak into beautifully prepared beds and then come back a week later and found that the whole bed's been dug over basically by voles and squirrels and the like, and they've taken pretty much all of the acorns. Then. So uh, more trees, they now grow all their acorns in um, in root trainers. And in this lower picture, this, this is what this is. This is literally thousands and thousands of oaks growing in root trainers. And all of that protection is to keep the mice and to keep the, uh, the squirrels off. We used to just cover them over with nets, and then we we actually found video, got video footage of a squirrel in the net. He got in in the night, and it was just sat there quite happily munching all day long. Um, but when you you are stratifying, you just do need to keep a check on things. So you need to check, as I said, there they haven't dried out too much, or they're not too damp. There's not too much light. There's not too much shade. You know, so it just depends on the seed type. But basically, I would say you put them in a fridge. You want to see a bit of condensation you know, forming on the inside of those bags, um, but you don't want it soaking. You definitely shouldn't be able to squeeze water out of that compost. Um, and again, if it's outside, the sort of same thing, you stick your finger in, and if it feels cool and damp to the touch, then that's fantastic. If it's dry, then you need to add a bit more water. If, you, um, if it's too wet, then um, if it's in a bag, you could potentially squeeze the bag and get some of that water to run out. If it's in the pot, then just don't water it for a while and, and check check the pot again. Make sure the pot has drainage holes as well and some stones in the bottom. Um, then when it actually comes to, they're going to start sprouting soon, uh, you need to be ready for that. So the things to think about, you see trays said, root trains or small pots, compost, uh, perlite vermiculite, if you mix those in, and that's really is to sort of get more air into your compost and so um, and can help with drainage if you've got quite heavy compost. And um, if you're going to go into the beds, the bare root beds, then you should have prepped those, you know, make sure there's no weeds in there to, uh, to when you're starting out. Have potentially some nets to protect from frost or protect from shade if it's sunny um, and watering we've talked about as well and, 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 and checking checking on these on these seeds i say check daily but to be honest with you once you've actually looked at them perhaps a day the next day and then after a week you'll have a better idea and you may then not need to revisit them for a few weeks or something because you'll have a good idea of, of, of the uh, state of the soil and the watering but i would um not make i would make up sorry your seed trays um and root trains and get those ready and i would say um, these non, not, you don't want to, I would say don't use a peat compost, but some composts that you buy, particularly from green waste manufacturers, they can uh, be very woody. There can be a lot of wood waste in there. Um, and those can actually get quite hard and form what's like a cap, as I said, you know, and get compacted. And then you, when you water, it's not actually going down and getting into that, into that mix. The roots aren't growing well. They're not getting the food or the nutrients. So that if if you're buying a compost and you find there's a lot of woody waste in it, you're going to have to add a lot more organic stuff into there. Um, and uh, and you want to might mix in some sharp sand, as I say, you know, to get more air into it, into it as well. The perlite it, it does promote water retention, and some people use things like swell gels and mix those in. But, um, you know, I, I know um, that Melcourt, Silvergrow or nursery stock at more trees, they just use that. They don't add anything to it. Um, you know, they're just using that product as a non p product and it's very, very high quality. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's eight, eight pounds a bag, 50 litres. So it's not really expensive and you know, it goes, goes a long way. So 
uh, do do look at your growing medium because that is really important. If you've gone to all this effort to collect your seed and then you've got to process it and stratify it and then you choose a poor growing medium, then you've wasted all your time. Um, so definitely, definitely um, talk to people um, to find out what, what works well. But as I said, you know, a carbon gold something that people use in Melcourt produces some really good ones. And then, um, you know, they're all non-peaked and, and work, work very, very well. And this is what, what it can look like sort of um, come early, early May, late April, early May. You've got seed trays, you know, I think this was spindle in here. So you can see you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spindle trees growing in there. Um, there was witch elm went onto this one. And here is lots of little hawthorns. And again, here this looks like some birch growing in here. This is older buckthorn, I think this was. Um, and then here we've got acorns. So everything start, will start to come at once. Um, and you need to be ready for it and you need to start um, thinking about moving it on, whether that's into the ground or into uh, individual individual pots. So what you want to do though is leave them until um, they've got ideally the, the second set of adult leaves. So not the these things here, these little ones here and like on here that you can see, they're, they're the cotyledons, they're like the first leaves. Definitely want to wait until it starts to put adult leaves out. That you can see here, and ideally, it's saying uh, at the earliest until the first set's coming out. But I would definitely wait ideally until two sets if you can. The adult leaves are showing, um, and then you hold them by the leaves, and then you prick them out. You might want to prick them out with a, with a, a teaspoon or a lollipop stick or something like that, just to ease them out and be very, very gentle. Definitely don't hold them by the stem. It's just very thin. Uh, tube and you know it doesn't have any woodiness to it so at that point if you squash it then that's it you've squashed the plumbers line them so, and uh, and can basically kill the tree um so wait have a be patient and let, let them come on a little bit before you start to move them on and uh, you know you can keep them in the pots they see here we've got holly growing individually in pots um this is probably stuff that has gone through one winter and it's the end of the summer um so they you know they're back but it's it's um growing really really fast here older grows super quick grow and grows fast um i think these are crab apples they grow crazily quick as well and so you know, some of these trees you can definitely um get them to a good size and uh within within a year of collecting that the seed but one thing that they definitely all need is um, watering, most important thing. So just saying here in terms of plant feeds, uh, mycorrhizal additives, people talk about uh, more trees, they're not adding anything. All they're doing is watering and making sure that they, they, you know, they've got a good growing medium, good compost, and that they're watered really, really well. And they're getting really good growth growth rates. Um, it's not so important because you know these trees are going out when they're um, twelve months to two years old generally. So what they're growing in is is absolutely fine for them. If you were to start to grow standard trees, much taller trees that you're going to keep in a pot for five years, then you then definitely you may want to start thinking about plant feeds or you may want to be topping up top like putting in sort of a fresh layer of compost and, and then that go into the into the pot as it were um mycorrhizal additives some people have said uh, they've had improved root growth with them um some people say that with mycorrhizal you don't know if you're adding the right type of fungi mycorrhizal fungi for that particular tree so are you actually enhancing or are you potentially causing conflict um and i think it's a pretty new science at the moment um I say I don't know enough about it to to make any real comment, but I, um, from from my perspective, I haven't seen a need for it in the nurseries that I've worked in, um, and the people I've worked with for adding mycorrhizal additives. I think that's a new science of something to come on, uh, come to in the future. But definitely, just like when you're growing in your allotment, you should really rotate 
your crop, as it were. So this um, crop rotation, if you will, from these species, so you've got your betulaceae, so you grow birch or hornbeam or hazel or alder in a bed, and the following year that you've lifted them out of that bed, you really should put something else in like the Fugacea species, beech oaks and chestnut or rosacea species, rowan, hawthorn, wild cherry. And by doing this rotation, it, it can reduce pests and diseases building up in the soil. Um, and I also think different trees have different impacts on, on, on soil in terms of the, the nutrients that they take up and what they return to the soil as well. So um, I think it improves the, the soil condition by doing some rotation as well. And uh, so that's just a hopefully a useful tip. Um, where to get information? So this is the Tree Growers Guide. It is available for retail, but it's also available um, online as well. So if you were to type in the Tree Growers Guide, you will find it has its own website, and you can you can download it from that. But you can also buy it from various uh, book sales places. And the price on average is around about. 12, 13 pounds with postage a pound. And then the more trees, cops in a box. So when I was working at more trees, we've got big grants, as I said, and we we're working with the tree council and so forth. And more trees created a series of videos. Um and uh they're really good production and they go through everything from seed collection, processing, stratification. Uh, growing on in your tree nursery, establishing a tree nursery and that's what to think about. Also about woodland design and hedgerow planting and woodland planting, looking after your trees, lifting, bundling. There's a suite of videos there and uh, and it's worth accessing. They're all on YouTube. They're all free to access. If you just typed that in, cops in a box, you, you, you will find the links come up in YouTube. But hopefully this works. I'm just going to show you a quick what, what was our intro um, video. So I'm just going to, fingers crossed, get this to work. Um, he says, It's here, planting time. This episode, we are going to look at where to plant your trees, how to look after them, after them on planting day, and details of each step in the planting process. You don't need a big space to get started growing trees. By planting more trees and planting them closer together, we can slow that flow of water and reduce the risk of flooding downstream. That's um, uh, just a snippet, really, which hopefully shows you sort of the quality of the image. Um, and also, you know, there is a huge amount of information on there, so that should work well. Uh, do do access those resources. Right. Now I need to get move on from that bit. Right. That's the next bit. Seems to be uh, not moving on. With no, I don't want to watch again. Oh dear me! <laughs> I might have to stop sharing and then yeah, just yeah, come just back. Sharing for a second. Okay. Let me move that out. Sorry about that. That's um, a bit of a pain.
Let me go to right, and then I'll have to go back to sharing again. Technology, eh? <laughs> but only a few more slides left anyway to, to chat about here. So right at the very end. So this was where I was going to actually ask for your help because I'm doing a bit of work with uh, Forest Research and they're really interested in this biosecurity issue around small nurseries and community tree nurseries. So the work that I'm doing is I'm interviewing uh, willing community tree nurseries to find out what they currently do uh, with regards to biosecurity. Do they do anything? Do they do nothing? And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just to get an understanding of what is happening out there because from the on the basis of this and, and the results of this, the Forest Commission uh, can then work with DEFRA uh, to potentially put out targeted information and put out potentially grants, you know, to help the community tree nurseries boost uh, biosecurity, maybe stuff like um, just simple stuff like boot washes and so forth or materials for cleaning um, cleaning tools or helping with waste management, plant waste management or other resources around um, forest reproductive materials and so forth. So I'm putting it out there to you to ask if you would get in touch with me if you're willing to have a chat with me. And it doesn't matter how big or small your operation is at all. It's just that uh, I need to speak to people over the next month um, and and get some information together for, for forest research. So you would be able to um, contact me and uh, I'll put that up. We'll move to Q&A in a second, but those are my contact details there. Again, you'll see them when you get the presentation, but if, uh, if you get in touch with me about that, that would be absolutely fantastic. And I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. <laughs> right, very good. Yeah, I can stop and breathe now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Adam. Um, we don't have an awful lot of time left, but I'm just going to pop through the chat and look at the questions. Um, Ellie Mayhew is asking, what kind of organic matter could you use with no dig? Bark chips, compost, that kind of thing? Yeah, I definitely use a compost. Um, and that's one of the issues we say with no dig is if you're using your homemade compost and you haven't got good uh comp quartz compost that's, that's basically managed to heat treat the seeds then you could be creating more of a problem for yourself uh but then if you were to go and buy compost there's a there's a cost element to that but some people use hay people use some grass clippings but not all just grass clippings they mix it up with um leaves that they've collected over the winter as well you know so they've sort of created a compost heap by using leaves and grass clippings and and then put that on the top newspaper work well strips of cardboard as well so uh all of those elements, um, uh, uh, but it takes time. So you, you build your layers up, but if you were to sort of do all that in autumn um, then, and go through a winter, that's fantastic. And if you were to do that in the spring and then want to try and plant into that sort of some weeks later, it may not be so successful. Lovely, yeah. Um, Anthony Mills is saying that double dig may be necessary if the plot is full of perennial rooted weeds, like yeah. bindweed, yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't disagree with that. And to be honest with you, you may find on your site that if you've got lots of bindweed or lots of ground elder, you may have to use some chemical treatment initially just to get on top of it and then work with it from there. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth Fletcher is saying, where do you get them from? I think she's referring to the root trainers. Um... Uh, well, you can get them from multiple sources. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tildenet, T-I-L-D-E-N-E-T, is where we've bought them wholesale, but I don't know if they will do them uh, in low volume. But if you wanted them only in low volume, then even Amazon, uh, you can buy them from there or garden centers, you know, the garden centers sell them as well. Mm -hmm. But depending on your plan in terms of volumes of trees, if you were to say do a thousand, then I would try Tildenet because if you think of a thousand of those individual um, cells as it were, then definitely go to the wholesale market rather than just buying them. Yeah. Um, Anthony saying, um, except cuttings of goat, pussy willow, salix, capria, which do not work well at all. So I'm assuming he's talking about 
sort of using them for cuttings and getting them going. Uh, um, different experiences then, because definitely, you know, Sailor's career uh, was, was what we growing more trees and cuttings. So I guess, again, it's different, different people's experiences. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, Phil Knott is saying the larger willows benefit from a larger cutting in his experience. He's not failed with rods the size of a baseball bat, but agrees right. that, wow. <laughs> that okay. smaller rods are much trickier. Um, and then Anthony is sharing that he thought that some some species such as blackthorn aces, junipers require period warm stratification before cold treatment required to break down double dormancy. Um, I think again, as I was sort of saying all through that, really, it will okay. there will be differences in different parts yeah. of the country. There's no doubt about it because the, you know climate, the climate across the country is so variable. And uh, yes, if it works for you, fantastic. Definitely yeah. keep keep doing it. But yeah. I would, I would encourage people to definitely experiment and um, find what works for them. And that's where keeping notes is really important. How long you've kept it, in what medium. And at what temperature, you know, is it ambient room temperature, is it ambient outdoor temperature, is it in the fridge? Do keep those notes and then go back to them and see what works best. Yeah. Um, Ellie Mayhew's asking, could you use a mild acid to replicate bird stomach acid for rowan, et cetera, to help remove the flesh? Or is it a mechanical only way of taking the seed? No, I, I think, as I mentioned about uh, the acid wash potentially for... Um, breaking down the the husks of, of seeds. I think with that, it's a case of, um, again, experimentation, because how, how how acidic is the mix that you make up? How long do you keep it in that mix? So again, you would, you, I would not apply the same mix to all your seeds that year, but perhaps to different types, you know, neat, uh, malt vinegar, chip shop vinegar, maybe, and then, then start to water it down, you know, and then, and, and see which works best. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, in interesting experiments if, you, if, if you've got the time to do that and work, work, work it out, fantastic. Uh, Yorkshire Dales Millennium Trust are asking, do you know of any success with holly without refrigerating? So holly without refrigerating is a case of, it can take up to two winters. So if you were to put it into a pot, that, that sort of compost mixed pot and leave it outside, or put it into, you know, we used uh, animal feed troughs to stratify and put literally thousands of seeds in and walk away and, and just let nature take its course. They will come. They will generally come through. It's just about time frame. But I don't know of a way to speed it up without putting it through some artificial stratification. Um, Anthony is saying that small leaf lime seed has highest viability from the top of the tree where it's warmest, gets most sun. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. I can see our volunteer insurance go through the roof. But, <laughs> but that is that is interesting, definitely. So because that, that would make sense. That would definitely make sense. Um yeah, if you can get a cherry picker in or something like that and collect the seed from the top of the tree. Brilliant. Elizabeth Fletcher saying that they get good germination of wayfaring tree using ambient temperature. That'd be interesting. Elizabeth could let us know what, what time of year, where she's in the country, what time of year she's collecting it. And when she says ambient temperature, is that outdoors all the time or is that some indoor, some outdoor? Yeah, that would be really interesting to hear that. So um, we're just sort of about out of time, but I was just thinking, Adam, if I save the chat and go through the, the rest of the questions um and then sure, yeah. do a follow-up email to everybody um with your points on those questions if that's okay yeah not a problem at all we can definitely do that um but thank you everyone for your questions and your comments really really useful so yeah i'll save that um, i'll try and shorten the next one so we get more time for q a uh, no that's fantastic and um as adam said we'll be sharing the slides um and yeah, it'd be lovely if you can contact him for further info on the um, consultation that you're doing as well for biosecurity. Yes, please, please, definitely. <laughs> we also have um, recordings of biosecurity webinars, obviously, on the um, Fellowship of the Trees YouTube channel. If you wanted to to catch up on any um, thing to do with biosecurity for yourself or your CTN.
Um, so the next part of this series, so part two is on July the 9th. I did put the link in the chat, but I will also email the link to you all in the follow-up email after this webinar. So thank you so much, Adam, for all your time and energy this Not evening. Not at all. Not at all. Enjoy it. Lovely. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's lovely to see you all. Thanks for being here this evening and have a good evening. All right. Cheerio. Thank you.